societies moving through time here. Uh, they're, they're, these societies confront various kinds of shocks along with the way, the energy shock or economic shock or a food system shock, and each one of these is uh, represented by these yellow dots. And, and at those points, there are, there are divergent possibilities. Uh, you might say space-time, if you want to think about it, or in a probability space. Uh, and uh, we have choices to make. Now, often we don't realize we have choices. It's always after, only after the fact that we think, oh, wow, we could have gone down a different path at that particular moment. But these are, as I say in the next slide, point this way, there we go, uh, moments of contingency when a range of possibilities might be available, when the system is fundamentally flexible. People are angry, they're looking for answers, they're willing to try new things, and there is an opportunity to move our thinking and our institutions, our behaviors and our technologies, and perhaps our, our thinking about planning in new directions from the way it's gone before, to break out of convention. And that is, uh, is a reason for hope because I think human beings are often their most creative in times of crisis, and it's in times of crisis when they actually have the greatest opportunity to implement that creativity. So let me talk a little bit about some of the things that I think might be contributing to those shocks in the future. And I could go through all five of those tectonic stresses I identified before, but today I'm just going to talk about climate and energy briefly. And these are going to be a big deal in your business. And the first one, We'll show you why. There we go. So what are you looking at here? Some of you may be familiar with this. This is a, called the hockey stick diagram that certain uh, climate skeptics have declared is a piece of scientific junk. Um, but uh, it's very well grounded in thoroughly worked out research. It's been reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, and adjusted and amended. And this is the latest version, and it's very solid science. So what are we looking at at this point? We're looking at a time scale going from 2100 back to 500 CE. Uh, uh, you have a temperature scale here, minus 1, plus 1 degrees Celsius here, all the way up to 7 degrees Celsius. Uh, uh, this little area of black line here represents the average surface temperature of the planet. It's a plot of the average surface temperature of the planet. Uh, during the period of time where we've been able to actually take temperature measurements using thermometers on the surface of the planet, so from about 1850 up to the present. Uh, these are projections out into the future based on climate models. And this is where uh, these scientists estimate we've been in the past. This is based on what's called proxy data, uh, tree rings and the like. The dark blue line is the mean estimate from those proxy data. And then the light blue area is the range of uncertainty around the mean estimate. Now, the debate about this uh, hockey stick graph and the, and, and the skeptics' attack on Michael Mann and his colleagues have, uh, have revolved principally around whether this period of time here, which is called the medieval warm period that occurred around 1000 AD, produced a peak that was higher than where we are right now. Now, the evidence seems to be pretty conclusive that actually we are already warmer than we were during the medieval warm period. But I actually don't think that this debate is particularly interesting. What's interesting about this graph is the contrast between where we appear to be going within the time span of the planning horizon that you're working with and where we've been in the past. Now during this period of time, temperatures varied about half a degree Celsius uh, over time. And this is the period of time when modern human civilization was laid down across the planet, where we laid down our settlement patterns, our infrastructure, our agricultural systems, our irrigation systems. And we're moving into a world that is radically different. According to the models, and you can, we can debate how accurate the models are, but I think there's reason to think that they are telling us something important. According to the models, uh, somewhere between about two and a half degrees Celsius and six degrees Celsius warming. You might think, well, what the difference does that make? A couple degrees doesn't really make much difference. Keep in mind that the total warming on the surface of the planet since the coldest period of the last ice age, 15,000 years ago, 
is only about 5 degrees Celsius. So in 100 years, we're adding on top of that 5 degrees Celsius uh, another at least 2.5 degrees and perhaps as much as 5 degrees or more. This is an extraordinary change. And we're moving into a temperature regime and a climate regime that is radically different from that which dominated during the evolution of human civilization. Now, I, I think the temperature itself is not a huge concern. If it's warmer, we can adapt, we can adjust. The problem is the rate of change, which is going to uh, present enormous trouble and problems for adaptation, especially of poorer societies that don't have a lot of resources they can draw on to relocate their populations, build new infrastructure, and the like. It also raises real issues for you. We're in a world here right now, which is only just, just outside the range of temperatures that we have experienced over the last couple of thousand years, but within a very short period of time, within the lifetime of your children. But by the way, I'm particularly aware of that now because my wife and I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old in the whole department. And I, I think about 60 to 70 years in the future. It gives you a very intimate connection to the future. Uh, it probably goes to your thinking, children? Uh, children. But, uh, you know, I'm not going children. Um, but most of you will. And, uh, and, and uh, you, you suddenly develop this, this, as I say, this very close connection to the future. And, and you, you're concerned about what's going to happen out towards the end of the century. So you'll have two reasons for being concerned about this, because it's a world A you're going to be living in, B your children are going to be living in even more because they're further into the century, and C professionally you're thinking about stuff that is still going to exist during this period of time. But let's go on to look about what might be happening right now. So probably quite a few, few of you have had statistics, which I hope so anyway, at least some familiarity with statistics. Um, you might think, oh, well, 100 years in the future, yes, that's a concern, and yes, I may be alive then and have children, but really, you know, what does it matter right now? Here's some evidence that we are starting to see changes immediately. This is, uh, these are, uh, it's a, a frequency distribution of uh, temperatures, uh, average temperatures in July in Moscow since 1950. Uh, and uh, uh, normalized here to zero degrees Fahrenheit. You can see, I'm sorry about the Fahrenheit, this is an American researcher. Um, you can see that this past July, and you heard about what was happening in, in Russia, in Moscow, was the, the smoke that it almost shut down the city, uh, caused a health crisis in the city, the extraordinary heat, and the collapse in agricultural production because a lot of crops died from the heat. Well, you can see the 2010, it was way off uh, on, uh, at the far end of the distribution, very far away from the mean. This is four standard deviations. This is a four sigma variation. That's the odds of that occurring just randomly are about one in 100,000. So that suggests there actually is something happening, that there are warming processes. And we're still living with the consequences of this. The, the, the impact on the Russian food system, on Russian grain production, is one of the things that's been contributed, contributing to the relentless increase in food prices in the world. And the increase in food prices has contributed to the riots in Tunisia and the current crisis in Egypt. This is uh, something of real consequence now. And we're just at the leading edge of climate warming. Matt, could you switch to the next slide, please? Another place where we're seeing this, uh, this change is in the Arctic. And I'm just going to show a little bit on the Arctic, but you need to keep an eye open for what's going on there, because it's not just stuff that's happening in the Arctic. It turns out to be important for people around the world. This is a satellite photograph of the Arctic Basin in March 2008. So this is Greenland here. This is the Canadian archipelago. There's Alaska. Here's Siberia. Now, March, March is the end of the Arctic winter, so that's the point a time in which the Arctic sea ice is at its greatest extent, when you've had the most freezing in the Arctic Basin and sea ice is spread out across the Arctic Basin as much as it's going to, it then starts to melt in the summer and it reaches its minimal extent in about September. So we're looking at the maximum extent in 2008, and you see some dark gray here. This is ice that is uh, one year old, single year ice, and then the multi-year ice is 